kids, and welcome to this month's episode of FAQ. You're here with your good buddy, Uncle Ben. On today's episode, I'm going to be answering a whole bunch of questions you guys have for me about gear and playing and all kinds of good stuff. But before we get into that, let's scope out Uncle Ben's boombox and see what I've been listening to lately. This month, I have been absolutely, hopelessly addicted to the record Sister by the band In Solitude. My buddy Jesse from the Say You Love Satan 80s Horror Podcast, which you can find on iTunes if you're a horror movie fan like me, is a huge fan of this record and uh, checked it out upon his recommendation. And as soon as I started it, I was hooked immediately. The first thing that it made me think of is Opus Eponymous by Ghost, which is one of my favorite albums ever. It's kind of got that sort of you know, late 70s, early 80s, like Merciful Fate, Blue Oyster Cult kind of aesthetic and feel to it, but the more you listen to it, the more you realize it's actually a lot different than that kind of stuff. Somebody told me that one of the guys in this band actually went on to play in Ghost, so it kind of makes sense. It's just this super melodic, super haunting, really dark, hard rock, you know, kind of proto-metal kind of sound with elements of like, you know, a little bit of stoner and doom stuff like High on Fire and Black Sabbath. I hear a little bit of that in what they do, but you also hear kind of this kind of raw old school punk edge that you get from early Misfits records or even the early Danzig stuff. The songs are super catchy and memorable. I uh, love the production on the record. It's kind of got this old school kind of dirty, you know, kind of rough sound to it. Uh, it sounds real, you know what I mean? Like I imagine this band sounds exactly like this live. Or at least they used to, because apparently they broke up recently. I listened a little bit to their first two albums that came before this one, and I really enjoyed them, but Sister, to me, is the one that just hooked me right away. It's got that super spooky, gothic, um, kind of haunting vibe. To me, this is like my official album of the Halloween season 2017. So yeah, put on Sister by In Solitude and get all kinds of spooked out. But enough of that, let's get on to these fackin' questions. First question today comes from Daniel Perry, who asks, which tremolo system do you like best? It's a good question. Let's talk about Floyd Rose Bridges first. So being a big old Ibanez guy like I am, I am a huge fan of the Edge and Low Pro Edge bridges that they put on a lot of their Japanese guitars. I know some guys like Vi or Satriani have preferences as far as the original Edge versus the Low Pro Edge, it doesn't really matter much to me. I think they feel, you know, pretty much identical. And the sort of raised back part of the original edge where the tuners are here that kind of sticks up like that, it doesn't really bug me. It does some people, I guess, but it never really gets in my way. You can see the low pro edge on this RG3120 here is a little bit more low profile and sort of sleek. It doesn't really stick up as much at the back. Again, it's not a huge deal to me either way. Another big favorite of mine is that Goto made Floyd that's here on this Sir Modern White Tiger that I love so much. Uh, I had never used one of these units before until this guitar, and I gotta tell you, I think it feels and responds every bit as smoothly as the Edge of the Low Pro Edge does. Really fantastic bridge. Overall, I would just say that I like the Edge Low Pro Edge and that Goto Floyd. Uh, just in terms of how smooth they feel and how responsive the bar is, it's got a really nice, light, smooth feel to it that you don't have to you know, muscle through too much, nor is it too overly sensitive. They stay in tune really, really well too. But honestly, one of the main reasons why I like those three tremolo systems so much is that all three of them feature these sort of steel collars that fit into the body that the tremolo posts actually screw into. So rather than the tremolo posts just screwing directly into the body wood, they actually sit in this metal insert. And the edge and low pro edge even go one step further and have a little set screw that locks the post into that collar that's set into the body for extra stability. I find that steel insert to be crucial, especially on Ibanez's and stuff which are typically made of, you know, basswood, which is on the softer end of the hardwood scale. See, with a lot of those cheaper tremolos and stuff that have the post just sitting directly in the wood of the body, well, every time you're rocking that tremolo and mashing down on it and stuff like this, it's really pushing that post around in the wood. And what happens is eventually, because again, basswood's a hardwood, but it's not all that strong in the grand scheme of things, that post rocking back and forth for, you know, years worth of time, eventually starts to make the post hole get kind of egg-shaped, like this right here. 
and you'll look at some of these old guitars and you can see the posts aren't sitting, you know, straight up like this. They're kind of leaning. And you can rock the tremolo and watch the post do this. At that point, it will not stay in tune no matter how well that it's set up. And at that point, what you've got to do is to re-drill that out and put a wooden dowel in there and re-drill it and put the post back in there again and just keep using it until it happens again because it's always going to happen. But with the tremolos I've been talking about, since the post sits in a steel insert, that will never happen. So it's a really, really great thing to have, especially on a basswood guitar. And as far as standard, like non-locking tremolos go, I think that the Goto 510 that uh, is just like this one here, my Sir Modern Satin, is absolutely flawless. I love this bridge so much. It's got a super smooth feel. It has steel inserts like I was talking about, so you can use it forever and it won't wear your guitar out, you know? Great feel, stays in tune super well, especially with some locking tuners and a good nut on your guitar. Absolutely awesome. I can't recommend that 510 enough. Really, really, really excellent bridge. Next question comes from Steven Van Rensburg, who asks, when you get the time, could you do a video on your entire guitar collection? You know, it's cool that you asked that because I just recently decided to do a new series that I'm gonna be debuting soon on my channel called Meet the Machines, which isn't necessarily going to be a gear review series per se, because this thing is gonna be all about pieces of gear that I own, that I use, that I've had for a long time, that I've used in the studio or on stage, or whatever, just pieces of gear that I have and that I love that have been time tested. On that series, you can expect to see complete in-depth looks at the specs and stories of all of these guitars that I've got laying around here, as well as other amps and pedals and other essential pieces of equipment that I use all the time. Be sure to drop me a comment and let me know what pieces of gear you would like to see featured first on the upcoming Meet the Machines series. Stay tuned for that. Next question here comes from Patrick Harju, who says, Oftentimes when I'm picking, my ring and pinky finger are anchored below the strings. Is this something that can inhibit the progression of my picking technique? So this is a question that I get from my students a lot of times, and honestly, I think if you would have asked me that question about 10 years ago, I would have given you a completely different answer than what I'm about to tell you. See, even a matter of like, you know, 10 years or so ago, you couldn't just go on YouTube and watch videos of anybody that you've ever heard of playing guitar and absolutely shredding the balls off. And so I assume that most people's picking looked like what I thought of as, you know, normal, just kind of loose fist picking with the wrist and stuff like that. But then, you know, as YouTube has grown and more and more guitar videos have popped up, I've realized that there are so many guitar players out there that play astoundingly well with vastly different sets of technique. Something I always tell my students all the time that I'm a huge proponent of is if you practice it, you'll get good at it. You know what I mean? Um, the anchoring thing, for example, if you watch like John Petrucci play, Petrucci is always wrapping his little finger kind of around the base of his pickup like that. You ever notice how none of his guitars have pickup rings? That's because that's his, you know, finger anchor, so to speak. Michelangelo Badio, also another guy that famously anchors. His picking technique is extremely weird too. Try to find anybody else whose picking technique looks like his, you know? But that's what I'm saying. He chose something, he stuck with it, and did it over and over and over and over and over again for thousands of hours, and lo and behold, he got good at it. I mean, hell, have you seen Marty Friedman play guitar? How in the world does he do that? Other than the fact that he made a decision, he stuck with it, and he got good at it. I've never been an anchoring guy for my picking, you know? But just because I don't do it doesn't mean that you shouldn't. There's plenty of great players out there that do. Hell, even Ingve tends to rest a little bit on the body of the guitar too. Doesn't inhibit him at all. I think there's two big things you always gotta ask yourself whenever you're deciding on technical stuff like that. And the first and probably most important one is, does it cause tension or pain, you know? If you're playing the way that you're used to, like let's say you're anchoring that you're talking about, and then you go back to the way that I play, where I don't anchor, I just kinda curl up like that, and you play like that for a while and it causes you tension and pain and you're sore and you're stiff and all that stuff, that's not an improvement, you know what I mean? Repetitive stress injuries due to tension and stuff can stop your playing dead in its tracks. So if it hurts, don't do it. If you can do it your way and you're totally relaxed and in control, I say go for it. The other thing you gotta ask yourself is does it create noise, you know? For me, that's why I've never played like Marty Friedman or Michelangelo Badio, because whenever I try to play that way, 
it makes a ton of noise. It does it when Michael does it, so you know, obviously he's got it worked up. But for me, that technique causes a ton of noise, so I don't do it. So yeah, if what you're doing is working and it doesn't create a lot of noise and it doesn't create a lot of tension, I say you're good to go. Stick with it and you will get good at it. Again, compare the way that like Vinnie Moore plays to the way that Paul Gilbert plays to the way that Ingve plays, the way that Petrucci plays, the way Aldi Miola plays, any of these monster players, you're gonna see completely different approaches to right hand picking techniques. Some guys anchoring, some guys don't, some guys fanning their fingers out, whatever. You just find what works for you, as long as it doesn't hurt or cause noise, stick with it, you'll get good at it. And yes, there are limitations to that rule. If you choose to do something just extremely stupid, like hold your, your, your pick like this, well, yeah, if you practice it, you will get good at it, but it will take you a hell of a long time. Here's a good one that's relevant for October. Uh, Guillaume Jayam Session asks, what is your favorite Halloween costume that you've worn, slash, what's your favorite thing about Halloween? So as for the Halloween costume, the first thing that came to mind is probably about eight or nine years ago, my wife and I dressed up as, as zombies for a big Halloween party that we were posting. And it was so fun. We went super, super all out. Like we went to thrift stores and got old vintage clothing and like rolled around in the dirt and like tore it up and like drug it behind the car and all kinds of other stuff. So it looked all kind of like, uh, you know, threadbare and like rotten and stuff. Like we'd actually like risen from the grave, put dirt in our hair, you know, did all kinds of like nasty blood makeup and all kinds of stuff. We looked awesome. I'll see if I can't dig up a picture or something and uh, put it on here. But I think that was probably the most fun, especially because the whole thing was just entirely homemade. Like, I think our costumes probably cost like $5 or something like that. And we looked super sick. And as far as my favorite part of the season goes, uh, I don't even know how to choose. Like, I love getting our house completely decked out. We decorate our house like crazy for Halloween. We've got a gigantic section of our attic that's nothing but all of our Halloween stuff. So, typically by the time that Halloween rolls around, we've decked out every square inch of our house, you know, with skulls and bats and spiders and ravens and all kinds of other cool stuff. So, I really love how decked out we get our house. Um, I really love sitting down and watching horror movies and stuff, you know, every night of the week, which I kind of do anyway, but it just seems extra cool, you know, during the Halloween season. Another thing I really love doing too is a lot of times my friends and I do a little, um, it's the Knoxville Horror Film Festival Grindhouse Grind Out film competition, where we make little short films of, uh, it's basically like fake trailers for horror movies based on a category that you draw out of a hat. It's a ton of fun. We've done a whole bunch of them. I put up last year's entry on my channel. So if you want to check that out, look up uh, Ben Eller Operation. And I'm sure that you'll find it, or just scroll through my backlogs and you'll find it from about a year ago. It's a horror movie trailer that we made based on the board game Operation. It was a ton of fun. We filmed it here at the house last year. It is always a blast doing those film contests. So yeah, house stuff, scary movies, film contest. I think that's probably my favorite things about Halloween. Well guys, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of FAQ. Be sure to leave me a comment letting me know what question you would like to see answered on the next installment. And before we go, I'm going to tell you guys something here. I've got a very special announcement to make that you guys might be getting a second installment of FAQ this month due to popular demand. I may have just wrangled an exclusive interview with goth rock superstar Davy Stranger. He might be doing a little FAQ segment here on my channel if you guys can provide some questions that you'd like to see answered by the strange one himself. For those of you guys who don't know Davy, he is an extremely dark and tortured poetic soul who does amazing music and has hosted a few episodes of Weekend Wank Shop here on my channel. I think episodes 48 and 100 of Weekend Wank Shop are the ones that he's done. Really, really amazing and profoundly deep guy. You can check out his music over at www.davystranger.bandcamp.com. She Needs Poetry is my jam. So yeah, be sure to comment down below with whatever questions you would like to see Davy Stranger himself answer on a special uh, Halloween surprise episode of Fact You. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ben Eller Guitars and go like my Facebook fan page over on facebook.com slash Uncle Ben Eller. 
and drop me an email if you're interested in booking some one-on-one -on -one Skype lessons. Uh, BenEllerGuitars at gmail.com is the address where you can reach me. Thanks again and stay tuned for all kinds of cool surprises coming up this Halloween on my channel. Cheers.